Okay, so I'm going to talk briefly about uh, smart materials for DIY projects. And so the phrase smart materials is a bit vague, and, but often it refers to just this idea of materials that have one or more properties that can be significantly changed. Let's see if I can get this to, nope. Might need to be closer. Too far? Oh, okay, got it. <laughs> So uh, let me just show you some examples before, um, just to get you in the mood. So uh, muscle wire is a shape memory alloy that contracts about 5% when electrical current passes through it. So this material allows us to create motion in a noiseless and very smooth way. Uh, this is an example by Access Labs um, made with, uh, okay. <laughs> oh, another one? No, it's not. <laughs> I can speak from here. Okay. So you get an idea. It's like it's very silent, very smooth, very soft. And here's another one of my favorites, which is conductive ink, which is a very simple material. It's basically a paint base infused with metal particles. Um, and it allows us to create uh, sensors and electrical traces with it. Uh, this is an example by Ji Kui, in which he used uh, conductive ink to create two skin resistance sensors and uh, connect them to a series of LEDs. Okay. Mm. Okay, and uh, electrotextiles are really, really interesting. They include thread, uh, fabric, and yarn, yarn with electrical properties. They are made by either blending or coating uh, textiles with uh, metallic fibers. We're not sure yet where this is going and what these materials are good for, but in my opinion, these are some of the most interesting uses, which is to make a large array of handmade sensors uh, for soft circuits. These are some examples by Kovacant, and here we can see a, a zipper slider, a crochet squeeze sensor, a piezo-resistive touchpad, an embroidered potentiometer, a knit accelerometer, and a tilt sensor. So conductive fabrics have also been used both by makers and by the industry to create things like um, jackets with embedded controls for smartphones, roll-up keyboards, and uh, interactive garments. And, uh, okay, so thermochromic pigments uh, are basically change color at a given temperature. And they can either be triggered by body heat or used in conjunction with heating, um, with heating elements like nichrome or just conductive thread. Uh, this is an example by Hannah Pernell Wilson uh, applied to where she used uh, thermochromic pigments for textile design. Okay, so one last example I would like to show you is this piece of acrylic called End Lighten. Uh, End Lighten is infused with colorless light diffusing particles. So what this means is that while regular acrylic only diffuses light around the edges, End Lighten actually illuminates across the entire surface. So when I turn on a series of LEDs around it, it's going to go from clear to an even color. And some of the uses we know for this are interior design, of course, you know, for partitions, etc., but also multi-touch systems. This is a really, really good material for that. So I began working with uh, some of these materials back in 2009 uh, when Kirsty Boyle and I decided to start to collaborate on a large-scale art installation that required several smart materials. And neither of us is a material scientist, so we quickly realized that most of the materials we wanted weren't available in quantities nor prices affordable to makers like ourselves. Uh, and what's more, the few materials that we could acquire 
came with no instructions on how to use them. So this seems very counterintuitive, like why sell something and not tell people how to use it? And the explanation is that manufacturers tend to see these materials as supplies for the manufacturing industry. So they only provide information, or some of them only provide information, even to their own clients under specific conditions, and sometimes even require non-disclosure agreements. So we realized that uh, the only way to go about this was through trial and error, which is how makers do it. Uh, we would take our best guess and verify, change one factor at the time until we got the material to do what we wanted it to do. Uh, we failed a lot and we documented both our failures and our successes. We also quickly realized that we had to share these experiments so others didn't have to go through the same process and also so we could gather a community that helped each other uh, to figure this out. So the result of that was a website we named Open Materials um, in reference to the open source movement. So Kirsty and I never actually finished that installation. Instead, we got uh, you know, very, very excited about open materials and even to this day we spend most of our free time researching and collecting information on materials which we share both through the website and through workshops. And so in the three years since we started the project, uh, the landscape has been slowly but surely changing. Uh, while in 2009 there were only uh, two or three suppliers of materi smart materials for makers, right now we have considerably more resources like Adafruit, SparkFun, and Inventables. Uh, there's still quite a f there's still a bunch of materials that are still very very hard to source and very hard to use, but we are see definitely seeing a difference. Uh, the fact that more makers now have access to materials also means that we're seeing a lot more documentation and tutorials online as makers uh, teach each other how to both create and use these materials. Uh, so here there's uh, just a couple examples. One is Lynn Bruning's uh, tutorials on how to use conductive thread and how to make your own conductive textiles and the other one is Koba Kent's How to Get What You Want, which is an amazing resource uh, that teaches you how to make sensors and actuators out of all kinds of smart materials. And this is all handmade. Uh, it's all uh, crafted. Um, okay, all right. So one of the areas in which we've seen the most progress and maker creativity in action as far as smart materials uh, uh, are concerned is in uh, what is called uh, soft circuits, which is electronics applied to textiles. So uh, these are just a few examples. This is a collection called Fairy Tale Fashion by designer Diana Eng. And here she used a few different types of smart materials and technologies to create uh, a collection of clothes that change color and shape. And this is a wearable toy piano by uh, Hannah and Mika, which allows you to play music on your t-shirt. <laughs> Uh, and they published all the files and instructions on how to make this so you can make your own. And also Diana from the, uh, the fairy tale fashion collection also uh, posted all her research weekly, so has an educational tool for classrooms. And then there are also quite a few projects that go beyond the artistic and the whimsical into the more practical. Um, okay. So here are like uh, three examples of that. On the left, uh, it's uh, Leah Bukley's uh, biking turn signal jacket, which uh, helps you, it's, it's an easier way to signal a turn when riding a bicycle. She published all the instructions on how to make your own. And then next to that is uh, Eamon's uh, conductive, uh, conductive fabric drumsticks, which allow him to play uh, an instrument of his own creation on an iPad using like actual physical uh, drumsticks and uh, at the bottom is well I don't know who first started this but since a few years ago it became common at least in New York where I live for people to sew conductive thread on the tips of their gloves in the winter so they can use the capacitive screens on their phones without actually having to take the gloves off so these are like what I find really interesting applications for uh, textile uh, smart materials for textiles 
So there are more, many, many more examples. And so the growth of soft circuits and the expansion of hardware uh, into textiles uh, is tied to the fact that not only these materials are easily acquirable, not very expensive, and don't require specialized tools, but also that they represent a new frontier for electronics and design. And we don't yet know where this is going, not, nor what, if any, in major innovations are going to come out of it, but it's already having a very interesting effect, I find. So many of us here today are, to some extent, nerds. We, it's true. <laughs> I mean, we love opening devices to look at mechanisms and building something that works is often satisfaction enough for us. But this newfound accessibility of materials is bringing new people into this playground. It's attracting artists, uh, designers, and crafters of all areas, and they're making our community richer, more interesting, and creative. And Dale mentioned earlier the, the laser printer that came out of Xerox Park. And the laser printer is a story of technical and commercial success, but it's also the story of how millions of people were introduced to a new form of expression, to a new form to express their creativity. So when we combine the know-how of hardware uh, engineers and chemists with the creative minds of designers, we should expect an explosion of creativity and innovation. So many... Uh, scientific discoveries were made in the process, in a process of free experimentation uh, without a specific application in mind, just f done just for the sake of acquiring knowledge and understanding the world. So it's in this light that I see the, the maker movement. A lot of the things we do um, serve mostly to satisfy our curiosity and, uh, ex <laughs> and express our, and our desire to, ex to express ourselves. But um, as open source hardware has already shown, as more and more people are given the tools to make, the chances of something extraordinary coming out of these experiments increase. So makers have the ideas, the will to iterate through both failure and success. And all we need is access to materials, tools, and some knowledge with which to start. Thank you for listening. <laughs>